There's so much that we can be doing with our lives, with our energy, rather than looking for visual indicators of, of anything at all about someone's soul. currently Frances Ullman and I am coming to you today again from beautiful Asheville, North Carolina at the banks of the French Broad River. Um, hopefully it'll be a little bit quieter this time than last time. There's still a road nearby but it's not as close so I think we should have better audio this time. Hopefully. I'm learning as I go. <laughs> I felt like sharing a story that keeps coming to mind um, and then just talking a little bit about it and how easily we get tricked by these the folly of our minds. It's just a really beautiful story because it's such a clear, sharp moment of what <laughs> that kind of jolts you. And I'm sure you've had similar stories too. So this story comes from, uh, it would have been over to, I don't know, it's like COVID is the line. So it was before COVID. It was just, a, it was uh, December before COVID. So we're talking about maybe just a couple months before we all jumped into that one. Um, and I found myself in Chiapas, Mexico, which is all the way southern, southern, southern Mexico, Mayan lands, which is why I was there. And I was there with a very dear, very queer friend of mine. Uh, you may know him. Uh, there are videos of him interviewing me on YouTube. And I was there with a group of, so he was the only person I knew. And then I was there with a group of women as well. And these women didn't know me at all. They didn't know anything about me. And I remember I was talking to one of the women you know, and she's just kind of sussing me out, like, what are you doing here? <laughs> um, you know, how'd I really been called? Or... And uh, so I explained to her a little bit about my backstory. And she said something like, well, no offense, but you don't look like someone who would be going to Mongolia. You, know, you kind of look like a soccer mom. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not a mom. <laughs> I have no children. Therefore, I have no children that play soccer. Uh, I'm in Chiapas, <laughs> living in the same hostel you're living in. Where did this comment come from, you know? And where this comment came from was her mind trying to assess who is and who is not spiritual enough to be moving in the circles that I was moving in. What I really um, quickly felt was the wounds of this woman. It's a funny comment to make to someone so directly. A little bit, it's a insult to me. You know, um, soccer mom has become an insult. Also, maybe you're a mom and your kids play soccer. Do you look like me? It's not about moms who have kids playing soccer, right? It's a it's a cultural cut. Um, and what I'm learning in that moment is nothing about me. And this is what I want us all to be kind of maybe thinking about experiences that we've had. Those little moments, we can take that in as a insult to us, or we can just reflect on, well, this person has just showed me one of their wounds. Oh, and I forgot to mention like two days later, uh, a Mexican man that I was hanging out with said almost exactly the same thing to me. He said something about, it looks like I would be a mom with kids who play soccer. And that's when I'm like, all right, team, I know they're messing with me. They're trying to pick at myself. You know, that's my training. I know my spirits were sending these comments to me because it got under my skin. It did. I had to work with it. I, a couple years ago, in the span of like two weeks, I had four different people, all from different countries even, over Messenger and whatnot, say something to me like, well, I hope you find what you're looking for. And I was like, I'm not looking for anything. When I have spirit send me messages <laughs> like repeatedly through different people, maybe you've noticed this happened to you too. That's when I know spirit's trying to give me the opportunity to look for one of the, um, one of the cages that I put myself in, one of like the bars of my cage. And they're saying, all right, you, you're maybe a little bit too much in the game of trying to prove to others. It was early on in my whatever happened and I wanted to prove to people I was okay even though I was now hearing voices. <laughs> it's a tricky, tricky place to be in, given uh, the people that I know anyway. Of course, if I had been raised in other cultures, they would have known there was nothing wrong with me. 
and uh, known how to take care of me as I went through those early stages. But I was early in my opening, we could call it, there's no good words for it. And I was busy trying to reassure other people I was okay. And so I kept having these people say these things to me. I got under my skin. I hope you find what you're looking for. And I wanted to be like, I'm not looking for anything. And it just was so flash triggering for me. I thought, okay, this is spirit giving me a gift of let's work with this and let's clear it out. Does anything come to mind? Has anyone ever said anything to you? I'm sure, someone has said something to you if you're still alive. That uh, was a comment about who you are, your appearance, where you were, that uh, you heard as an insult to you. So let's, let's think about this as a flip. This is nothing about you. You know who you are. You're what's inside. They didn't know you. They don't know your full story. So let's think of the flip. This was about them. What did you just learn about them? Our judgments, the ways that we judge other people, they're actually just the ways that we guard our own prison cell. They're the way that we keep ourselves trapped from being able to live in the infinite. And especially if you're watching this, you may be interested in things like um, the spirit, spirituality, walking a spiritual path. Uh, let's, let's examine our minds a little bit, how quickly these funny um, mind categories can uh, cause us harm. So if I say to you, what does a spiritual person look like? Does something come to mind for you? Now, if I say, what does, oh, hi, there's a dog. Ah, hey, bud. <laughs> no, it's uh, adorable. What's your dog's name? Riggs. Riggs? Uh-huh. He's adorable. Thank you. Are you in a meeting? No. Okay. No, no, I'm just filming something. Oh, my world stops when a dog runs past. Uh, okay. <laughs> so now let's play a little bit more. In your mind, if I say to you, what does someone look like who has like good mental health? I say mental health in quotes because we can't separate mental health from the full package. Body, spirit, soul, karmic, karmic energy. What comes to mind? I think a lot of the um, spiritual communities, we could say, that I um, encounter sometimes in my uh, wandering, uh, the I idea of like a spiritually minded person or someone with good mental health. Um, I think often we think of someone being calm, uh, not quick to anger. But what about those souls that are quick to anger? Um, I do carry perspectives that say anger is something to be maybe worked with and a sign that there's something to release but it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It's just kind of your homework assignment um, in this lifetime. Thich Nhat Hanh has this really beautiful quote about anger, which I love. He says, when you have pain within you, the first thing you have to do is bring mindfulness to embrace the pain. I know you are there, little anger, my old friend. Breathe, I'm taking care of you now. You'll be able to look deeply at the true nature of your anger. This discovery, this understanding, this wisdom will liberate you from your pain. I love this quote so much because there's such a calm sereneness that is present, that is present with the anger. So we might have these ideas in our mind of what, you know, like what mental health looks like. It comes to mind is like depression commercials where suddenly they're like serenely going to their jobs that they hate, but they feel fine now. I don't really think that's what mental health looks like, but it, it's interesting when I asked you, what do you think of did something come to mind, right? And this is what we're talking about. What's in here that's in the way of blocking us from being able to see the true nature of reality. Like, would you ever look at a tree and think, ew, that's not what your kind of tree is supposed to look like. You're supposed to look like this other example of this tree. It's just, we can't, <laughs> I don't know why we're so primed to be so especially cruel to others in our species. And then we can immediately say, oh yeah, I would never think of a tree that way. It can be so tricky because it's what our brains naturally do. Our brains naturally take many examples 
and create categories, generally speaking, we create categories by creating a generalization. But some minds actually don't do that. Some minds just hold specific examples for categories. There's so much diversity even in the way we perceive the world with our eyes. Largely speaking, those of us um, with vision are a visual being. Where we get trapped is thinking that there is uh, <laughs> much information at all in this visual information. So let's think about this right now. If I say to you, what does a surfer look like? Is there a specific gender that comes to mind? A specific age that comes to mind? Do you think of someone being able-bodied when I say, what does a surfer look like? Notice if you have like a general concept of what a surfer looks like and let that go, right? Anyone can be a surfer. How about when I say um, soccer mom? Does something come to mind? Does she look like me? <laughs> um, of course, anyone that is a mom and has a kid playing soccer is a soccer mom, right? So again, let that go. These are just fun little games to play to recognize, oh my gosh, we have a lot of junk up in here <laughs> that gets in the way of us being able to perceive things clearly. And in the spiritual path, I see that getting people really mixed up in a lot of ways. One way is people try to look more woke. Um, they try to have visual indicators that they are um, on a spiritual path. Um, you can't look, you can't look spiritual. That's not a thing, you guys. I know you know, I know you know, but let's just like remind ourselves because again, visually we get taken advantage of. So if someone looks at me and they're gonna say they see a soccer mom, uh, whatever, I don't care. <laughs> Go see whatever you see. <laughs> I'm gonna see from my heart, which is, my intuition telling me I don't really feel like sharing much more with this person. I don't feel like being close with this person because they're not recognizing the infinite in me. And there's not that, there's just nothing there for me. It's just not interesting to be in connection with this person. And I did leave sooner than planned from that group. I just wasn't vibing with it. I'm gonna see also the divine in this person. I'm gonna see through the wounds and hearing through the wounds that they are actually doing nothing but guarding their own prison cell and I'm gonna let myself out. And the way we let ourselves out is, I just, again and again, I find myself saying like, can this be fixed? I don't think so. What are you gonna do, like make flashcards of like random humans and say, this is a surfer, this is a surfer, and like update your files, then you go on to cook. Then you go on to like mechanic. I don't think that's the way to do it. I think the way to do it is just be like, oh my gosh, it is such a mess in here. This is a product of cultures I don't even want to be a part of. <laughs> I'm just gonna leave it be. I don't think there's anything else to do, but drop down lower where I can be in connection. I'm gonna live here and I'm gonna try to see others through here. Finding my way out of my own cage. So when we're looking for online teachers, we're looking for uh, point to, pointing out instruction, it's hard to figure out who should I be taking information from. And because we're visual, we go to how do they look a little too quickly. Um, if I were to show you a picture of, let's say, a Tibetan Rinpoche. So Rinpoche is a highly recognized teacher uh, within Tibetan Buddhism. You might have the association of someone who is uh, enlightened, who's closer to enlightenment. Um, that one is really easy, easy to snag a lot of our minds. I had the good fortune of spending about four years in uh, Tibetan refugee communities, um, living in Nepal and India, eventually marrying a Tibetan a refugee. He had actually been a Lama, so he was in the monastery from when he was about six to about 20 or so, it's not a failing. They can, he's Nigma Lama, they can choose to leave. I met him um, as he was saying prayers. Ooh, did that get me excited. Um, we eventually married and it became abusive. So I had the good fortune of having uh, that and actually knowing um, more personal stories of lots of Rinpoche's and high teachers in that, um, mix of consciousness. These are not enlightened beings. <laughs> Putting on robes does not change who you are. The only thing that changes who you are is doing work within yourself. And you and I can do that work as much as any Tibetan Lama. And just as we can choose not to do that work, those in robes often choose not to do the work also. But visually we get trapped. 
we get stuck. We see someone wearing robes and we think they might know something. Well, they might have access to teachings, but we might trust them a little bit too easily. So what's the remedy for this? How do we get out of looking? <laughs> looking and into seeing. And we're looking, we want to be seeing. The remedy is learning how to see with our heart. When I say that, what may come to mind is some wavy gravy, kumbaya, let's just love everyone. Yes, of course, let's love everyone. We're all different expressions of the same consciousness of infinite love and compassion, but boundaries, people. When I'm saying see, what I mean is listen more deeply. Do I feel safe around this person? You know, our bodies, our energy and our bodies communicate to us. Look around at the other followers that a teacher might have. Is there a general um, sort of feeling in the group? Are they a little too spaced out? Are they a little overly confident? Are they using their sexuality in a healthy way or in a way that feels unsafe for you? You know, when we look with our eyes, that's how we get cult leaders, <laughs> frankly. We have to listen with our hearts and sometimes listening with our hearts means going against entire groups of people who say otherwise. But inside, in our hearts, listening more deeply, there is gonna be a little whisper of intuition that's gonna tell you, I know that this is a very popular teacher maybe even, but something in me is telling me this is not the place to be. So let's stop looking at others um, in judgment Every single time you look at someone else in judgment, it's a part of you trying to learn about yourself, right? You don't know them. You don't know their story. Even if there's someone you live with in close connection, you don't fully know what it is to be them. Judgment is never about the other person. It's always about you trying to uh, monitor and guard yourself, guard your own cage, keep yourself of where you've been told you like should be. So let's just uh, notice when we judge other people, especially visually, and let it go. Just let it go. It's just garbage, garbage in that's come from this uh, garbage filled culture around many of us and move down into the connection uh, with the innate wisdom in our heart, that space within ourselves that can never be touched from the outside. Even if you've never found it before, I promise you it's there. It just takes some practice sitting quietly to find it. If you like uh, these kinds of conversations, please consider clicking like and subscribe. It's, uh, I'd really appreciate it. It's nice to know I'm not just talking to myself. Any comments you feel like leaving, I'll definitely check them out. I'll also leave my contact information below if you'd like to reach out to me. Thanks for giving this a listen.